Hello, and welcome to our podcast on fiscal and monetary policy. In this podcast, we'll be taking a look at a host of new vocabulary terms, including fiscal and monetary policy, what economic indicators inform our government on these two policies, and to what extent, if any, they should be applied, how each policy works and how they are applied, and why they are important when dealing with market failure. So, let's go ahead and get started. First, let's get some perspective and remind ourselves of some basic economic indicators. Previously, you watched a podcast on quite a few of these indicators. For the purposes of this podcast and unit, and providing you some context on fiscal and monetary policy, we'll re-mention three indicators in specific. Gross domestic product, unemployment, and inflation. Gross domestic product, commonly called GDP, you'll recall, is defined as the total value of everything or all goods and services produced by all the people and companies in the country. It is arguably the best and most direct way to measure a country's economy and is represented in dollars. Unemployment, then, is defined by the Bureau of Labor Statistics as the percent of people who do not have a job, have actively looked for work in the past four weeks, and are currently available for work. Also, people who were temporarily laid off and were waiting to be called back to that job are included in the unemployment percent. Finally, inflation is defined as a continued increase in the general level of prices for goods and services in a country and is measured as an annual percentage change. In other words, as inflation rises, every dollar one owns buys a smaller percentage of a good or service. Economists continually use this data to examine the health and state of our economy. By looking at the long-term business cycle in the United States between 1835 and 1985, we can see many examples of both good times and bad. Specifically, we can see a number of what economists call troughs, or times when the overall economy has failed, as well as peaks, or times when the overall economy has been successful. A couple of the things you should be looking at in specific with this economic history is at what times are the troughs the deepest, and at what times are the peaks the highest. Also, consider the pattern of when troughs and peaks occur. Does one cause the other? or does one result from the other? Several of the examples present in our economy's history here are the direct result of one another. Take a second and try to identify a couple of examples that may answer these questions. Throughout the course this year, you've heard us discuss the economic concept of laissez-faire, or the belief that a government should leave businesses alone, both when they are succeeding and failing. This type of concept, if you remember, is most commonly going to be seen in a more free market economic system. Adam Smith, commonly known as the father of economics, was the first economist to use this term in describing how economies operate or work. This specific concept is better understood as classical economic theory. Let's see if we can now use a more modern example to illustrate how this principle works. If you, for example, were the owner of a failing business, like a typewriter repair store, you would probably be failing because of the path technology has carved in our economy and lives. As a consumer, then, I'm probably not going to be getting my broken-down typewriter repaired because I can just simply purchase a computer or a tablet or even a phone and do similar as well as so much more with it than the typewriter. That being said, if you, the owner of the repair store, are failing and going to be going out of business, in a free market, the government will not come to your rescue. They would be following a laissez-faire policy. The belief here is that the market will naturally have its ups and downs. In other words, there will be both peaks and troughs over the course of many years. Therefore, the market will, what Smith suggested, self-correct, even though this means there will be both winners and losers if the government chooses to employ a laissez-faire policy. To help further illustrate this point, let's take a closer look at how classical economic theory and laissez-faire policy is applied to, say, farmers. So, as our example says, in year one, some farmers choose to grow corn. Corn is in high demand, so prices will rise, naturally, and farmers will make more profits. So far, so good, right? Let's now consider what would be a fairly natural economic response here. In year two, many other farmers begin to switch to growing corn, causing a decrease in the water supply. In this case, consumer demand did not change but the high supply of corn now on the market will lower prices, again, naturally. Consequently, some farmers will lose money, and as a result, they can't pay their debts. 
So the market is failing some producers. The market is then creating both winners and losers. In year three, then, because so many farmers switched to growing corn in year two and used much more water than available, a separate lesson in economics related to scarcity, a drought hits. The poorest farmers in our scenario lose their farms. The now unemployed and homeless farmers begin moving to cities. Farmers with some savings are able to survive, and farmers with more money can buy foreclosed farms and expand their operations. In any of these fictional, although plausible, scenarios, the government is absent from intervening and saving the farmers that have become losers. The government, then, has used Adam Smith's recommendation of leaving businesses alone, or they've employed laissez-faire policy or classical economic theory. In other words, this example demonstrates a classical free market where there is little to no government involvement in the workplace. The opposite of classical economic theory, then, is called Keynesian economic theory, named after its namesake, John Maynard Keynes, whose claim to fame came in the 1930s with many of the New Deal policies that helped to pull our country out of the Great Depression. According to Keynes, he believed the government should take a more active role in the economy when necessary and try to smooth out the ups and downs of the economy. This specific economic theory is then clearly moving our focus away from the free market system seen under the classical economic theory, and moving it more toward the left side of our economic system spectrum, or a command economy where the government plays a much larger role in the economy. So during bad times, or what economists refer to as contraction, the government should increase spending to create more demand. This would be like adding hot water to a cold bath. The hot water would raise the temperature of the bath water and keep you more comfortable for a bit longer. Clearly, the government is directly inserting itself where individuals in the marketplace would otherwise not. Conversely, during good times, or what economists refer to as expansion, the government should lower or decrease spending to lower demand. The point here is to not overheat an already hot economy. Return to the previous example of the bath water for just a second. If the water in the bathtub is already warm enough, there would be no need to make it hotter because it would ultimately make the bathwater uncomfortable again. The big takeaway here with Keynes' economic theory is to allow the government the ability to either heat things up when they are cold or cool things off when they are too hot. The market will still operate accordingly, but it's simply a matter of the government stepping in when necessary. Let's for a second return to our earlier examples of farmers to apply Keynes's theory of government intervention in the economy. So again, in year one, some farmers have chosen to grow corn. Corn is in high demand, so prices will rise, naturally, and they make more profits. So far so good, right? Let's now consider what would be a fairly natural response economically here. In year two, many other farmers switched to growing corn, causing a decrease in the water supply. In this case, consumer demand did not change, but the high supply of corn now on the market will lower prices again, naturally. Consequently, some farmers will lose money, and as a result, they cannot pay their debts. So, the market is failing some producers. The question now is, how does Keynesian economic theory differ from classical economic theory and laissez-faire policy? In this case, the government would start buying corn, possibly shipping it overseas as food aid, for poorer countries. Here, the extra demand from the government, that is, helps to stabilize the price of corn. The majority of farmers, then, will make profits. As previously described, in year three, a drought hits, because so many farmers switched to growing corn after year two. Earlier, the poorest farmers lost their farms, began moving to cities, and only those farmers with some savings survived. And farmers with more money bought up the foreclosed farms and expanded their operations. To help control the instability, or smooth out the trough, Keynesian economic theory, following year two, would now allow for more farmers to have savings and thus be better able to survive year three's drought. The lower supply of corn kept prices up. As a result, the government doesn't have to buy as much corn in order to stabilize prices. We can now extend our farmer scenario out one additional year. So in year four, we might see the drought from year three ending. As a result, the higher supply of corn returns, which predictably lowers prices. The question to consider here is, what does government do? How do they respond? They should respond accordingly, like they did in year two, correct? 
These examples illustrate the economic concept known as fiscal policy. In summary, Keynesian economic theory differs from classical economic theory and laissez-faire policy because the government is directly getting involved in the economy. The fact that the government is involved in smoothing out the market's natural ups and downs is also known as fiscal policy. Therefore, when describing Keynes's theory, you are also describing fiscal policy. They are one and the same. So let's define fiscal policy. Fiscal policy involves taxing and spending by the government to help stimulate or encourage the economy. When the government makes purchases by taxing and spending, they are thus increasing economic activity directly. They are employing Keynes's economic theory and inserting themselves directly to help the economy. In other words, as the government increases its taxes, they reduce household spending and investment in the market. Because people have to pay more in taxes, they have less than to spend on goods and services. And conversely, when the government reduces its taxes, households are able to increase their spending and investment in the market. Like the economic concept of demand and the law of demand we studied earlier in the course, this represents an inverse relationship. One piece I'd really like to emphasize right now, though, related to fiscal policy or Keynesian economic theory, is that although the government is directly involved in the market or economy, the government does not give jobs. Rather, they encourage them by way of using taxes and spending and investment. In other words, if the government reduces its taxes on producers, then they should be able to increase their spending and investment in those businesses. Similarly, if the government can reduce its taxes on consumers, then they should be able to make more purchases and increase their spending. However, if the government increases their taxes on producers, then those business owners will be more likely to decrease spending and investment. And if the government increases its taxes on consumers, then they will be more likely to decrease their spending on investment on goods and services. Again, such decisions illustrate the inverse relationship I spoke of earlier. The best and most successful example we can point to in our economic history involving fiscal policy is that of the Great Depression. If you recall from the long-term business cycle we saw earlier, the Great Depression was this country's worst financial crisis of all time. At its worst, the unemployment rate in America was 25%. That means one out of four of us were unemployed. This occurred in 1932, but all throughout the 1930s, you can see that our country and government really struggled to get the economy going again. It was only through our involvement in World War II and a seriously heavy amount of government spending on war supplies and goods that we were able to pull ourselves out of that financial crisis. Because the Depression preceded the war, meaning came before, American businesses were unable to spend and invest in their companies and employ more American workers. The only entity that was able to do so on such a large scale was the American government. They did so by decreasing taxes on producers and increasing spending on war-related goods and supplies. So again, when the government is directly involved in the market or economy by way of taxing and spending, this is known as fiscal policy. One question we're consistently asked in economics is which economic theory is better? To be honest, that is a matter of your personal opinion, but also one that is probably connected to your political ideology or beliefs. In other words, if you tend to associate yourself with a smaller government and slower rate of change moving forward, you are then probably a supporter of a more conservative political belief system, and you are probably going to favor a more free market economic system, where the government does not involve itself in the economy. Or they apply that classical economic theory and laissez-faire policy of dealing with the market's natural ups and downs. However, if you find yourself agreeing with a larger size of government and a faster rate of change moving forward, you probably tend to associate yourself with a more liberal approach to government, and you are more likely to then align yourself with the Keynesian economic theory and fiscal policy, because the government is more involved in the economy. In short, it is not about being better than the other, but more about recognizing the connection between the government spectrum and economic policy and theory. This brings us to the last piece of the podcast, the Federal Reserve System, also known as the Federal Reserve or simply the Fed. It is the central banking system of the United States. Created in the early 1900s, after a series of financial panics, there existed the desire for central control of the monetary system in order to lessen or reduce financial crises. Over the years, events such as the Great Depression in the 1930s and the Great Recession during the 2000s 
have led to the expansion of the roles and responsibilities of the Fed. For the purposes of our understanding, we need to discuss two specific controls the Fed has at its disposal. If the market were to fail and the government were to take an active role, or a Keynesian approach to dealing with such failure, the Fed could, one, choose to raise or lower the amount of money currently in circulation, which is what economists call the money supply. The result of putting more money in circulation would cause inflation. The reason for this would relate to the value of our money. In other words, the more money there is in circulation, the less valuable it is. It becomes less scarce, so its value declines. And, if the Fed were to take money out of circulation, it would actually control this said inflation because there would be less money in circulation. Thus, it would be more scarce and therefore more valuable. The Federal Reserve could also choose to raise or lower the interest rate it charges banks to borrow money. Do you remember the discount rate defined in the earlier Economic Indicators podcast? The result of the government acting to lower the discount and interest rates would encourage people to borrow more money to help the economy expand. And raising the discount and interest rates would encourage people to borrow less money, which would contract or shrink the economy. These examples illustrate the concept known as monetary policy, which impacts the money supply in order to achieve price stability and thus control interest rates. By lowering or decreasing interest rates, the government can make loans to businesses and individuals cheaper, which means economic consumption can increase, which is also known as economic expansion. Therefore, choosing to raise interest rates can make loans to businesses and individuals more expensive, which means economic consumption decreases or, like we said earlier, contracts. Okay, that takes care of our podcast on fiscal and monetary policy. Between this one and the previous podcast on economic indicators, We've discussed a whole host of terms and concepts critical to understanding market failure and both how economists determine the health of an economy and how they might choose to respond. If you have any questions on either, please be sure to write those down and bring them into class. We'll try to get each of them answered. Thanks for listening.